Okay, we're going to get started. I'm going to turn my mic on. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Should I put it louder? I'd, I'd like to get, I'd like to get started. Hey! I was a youth pastor for 25 years. I have that little whistle. Is that better? Testing one, two, three. Testing. If I put it up closer to my face? Yes. Who would open us with a word of prayer tonight? Man, Amando, I think his hand was second. No, just kidding. Would you open us in prayer then? Let's do that. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, you should open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. And we're going to hit Mark chapter 4. We're going to look a little bit at uh, one of the passages. Looks like I've knocked this off already from the mic, but I think it'll work without that. Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. That's what this blue thing says right here, Peggy. That's Mark 4, 10 through 12. Heather, that's what that says. Sure. So if you turn your Bibles there, because um, I, want to, uh, I want to start there because I think it does a good job of helping us understand parables. And uh, let me just read a little, a little introduction, that I, I, a quote that I took from the book. It says... Um, <laughs> Somebody's sharing. So here's the quote from our book. How could these simple, direct, little stories Jesus told pose problems for the reader or the interpreter? Well, for all their charm and simplicity, the parables have suffered a fate of misinterpretation in the church Second only to the book of Revelation. If you don't have that one underlined in your book, find it. It's on like the first page, uh, near the bottom of the first paragraph. Underline that little s couple of sentences in there. You would think Jesus is telling little stories, right? They're, they're, they're these cute little stories that have, have uh, all sorts of fun things going on in them. And he's telling them in a way to teach something. So wouldn't you think we would be able to read them and immediately understand them? Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Right. And so our author says that uh, we sort of um, dismiss why they're not understood by misunderstanding Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Do you remember reading that? I know someone did because they were like, I don't think I like this. I don't agree with it. This is not true. He's dismissing Jesus. It can, I think we need to be careful when, when we say what we say about Jesus. Amen? Amen? Let's be sure we're saying what we're saying. And I think we need to look at what the author is saying because he's, he's making a pretty bold claim. Didn't I tell you last week that this chapter would step on your toes? Okay. So he's saying that some of, the, some of the main ways we think about parables is actually a misunderstanding of the misunderstanding that Jesus is talking about. So in Mark chapter 4, verses 10, 11, and 12, my Bible goes like this, NLT. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. You, he replied, are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God. It's giant lettered blue because that's the main thing that I want you to leave with the entire night. Kingdom of God. What are the parables all about? The kingdom 
of God. You can say that every parable Jesus talks about is in some way discussing the kingdom of God. Now that we're not misunderstanding. I think Jesus is pretty clear there, right? They're teaching you about the kingdom of God. Okay, we got that. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Okay. So, we have... For, for, yeah, for a long time, we have thought in terms of that Jesus spoke this way so he would, he would make it so people couldn't understand, right? And this is, this is actually just Jesus following the scripture and what it said, right? But what, what Jesus is saying is, is that it doesn't, it's for those of them who hear but don't understand, it, it goes in here at the head, but it never makes it down to the heart. Okay? Because, do you think that the Pharisees were, was he speaking parables to the Pharisees and did they understand the parables? Why did they get angry at him after he spoke parables if they didn't understand them? They understood them. Does Jesus ever say anything to intentionally confound someone? No way. What he's saying is, is that just like, well, think, think Luke chapter 3. You've got Jesus, he gets baptized, and then what happens directly after that? He goes into the wilderness for how many days? Right. And who is he there with the entire time? The enemy, the Satan, the opposer. And how does the enemy try to do battle with Jesus? He quotes... He quotes the word. You mean Satan knows the word? But he doesn't let it go from here to here. He doesn't let it change who he is fundamentally on the inside. He will not allow scripture to penetrate his heart. Jesus is saying, I teach in parables that they may be confounded by truth so that it would not penetrate their hearts. They're not allowing it to penetrate their hearts. Similar, again, how does Pharaoh's heart get hardened? 98% of the time, the scripture tells us Pharaoh hardened his heart. One time, I think it is, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You know what God is doing 98% of the time? He's agreeing with Pharaoh's approach to him. That's all Jesus is doing when he's teaching parables. He's agreeing with a world who doesn't want to understand him or understand the true nature of the kingdom of God. Don't believe me? What did the disciples think the kingdom of God was going to be? I'll take you to Acts chapters 1 and 2 when he's, Jesus is still on planet earth, right? Chapter 1. He's with the disciples and what do they ask him? Hey, Jesus, are you finally going to take over the Romans and reestablish the Israeli power structure and government so that we might have the prominence we once knew? And you can just see Jesus. He's kind of like hitting his forehead going, Ah, wait for the Holy Spirit to come, would you? <laughs> they misunderstood it, and they walked around with Jesus. So there's a misunderstanding there where these Pharisees and people who, who had preconceived notions about who the Messiah was going to be, they couldn't see the Messiah right in front of them because they were confounded by the truth that they saw. He teaches parables to teach these little truths, to, to get them to wake up. He wants them to understand. His original audience, he wants them to understand what he's saying and be confronted by the truth, but they won't allow it because their hearts, Jesus says, your hearts are far from me. So when our author says that there's a difference between the way we've understood Mark 4 and how it really is, is what I'm talking about for our devotional right now. I wanted to walk you through that. It steps on our toes to think about it in a way that, we, you know, 
we, we think, well, Jesus, he, he, he didn't have many followers and they, were, they had a hard time with him because they just, they, they, they couldn't understand what he was saying. They could understand what he was saying perfectly well, but they weren't willing to succumb to Yeshua HaMashiach, which is the Hebrew for Jesus Messiah. Yahweh saves, and Mashiach is, is, the, is the title for him, the, the rescuer, the, the kinsman redeemer, if you will, the and the Messiah. One. Yes, what? The anointed. The anointed one, right. The, the anticipated one, the one that the scriptures all talk about. And so Mark 4.12 tells us that these parables that Jesus is teaching, here's the Greek parabole. It's the Greek word that means a comparison, Literally, that's what parable means. That's the etymology of our, our word, parable. You're welcome. That's free. <laughs> um, that, that's from this book, which is one of those that was highlighted last week, The Method and Message of Jesus' Teachings. Um, this is one that was, was uh, suggested as you should get it if you want to understand uh, the methods of Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. And uh, here's the physical copy. Got it. Um, the, the section on parables is a great companion to our book, right? Because it talks about the fact that parables basically come to us in three forms. And there they are. There are types. And uh, um, this method and message uses the word long form story. Our book says that they're true parables. Our, our book calls them true parables. It's the telling of a story. Like the Good Samaritan is a great example of that. That's a long story Jesus is telling. That's a, it's, it's, getting, it's, it's confronting a group of people with a truth about the kingdom of God. Did I mention kingdom of God? <laughs> kingdom of God. There you go, okay. It's all of the parables are, that's what they're about. They're, they're really trying to help us understand that. So there's the long form story, true parable. There's a similitude, which is like an extended simile, like or as, for those of you who are in English class, using the kingdom of heaven is like yeast in dough. That's one of the similitude. It, t it takes a lot of words to tell you a simile. It's not just a sentence. It's actually a paragraph of a like or as. And then you have metaphors and similes which are very short. You are the salt of the earth is a good example of a metaphor to help us understand the kingdom of God. Are you ready for it? Because it's gonna happen all night tonight. It's gonna be really frustrating by the end. But you're going to understand that the main point of every parable that Jesus is talking about is to open a window into what the kingdom of God is. And, and it's really just a, an amazing um, method for God to talk about himself and what it's like to be in his kingdom. Okay, so the, those are the three main kinds. Um, we moved into exegesis. And there's just really two things you need to remember about when you're doing exegesis. And that, that's exegesis, two points to remember for those of you at the back of the room. Exegesis, two points to remember. One is, what are the points of reference? That's what number one is, points of reference. Number two, where does Jesus drop the bomb? Where does he turn the story on a dime? The unexpected turn in the story is number two. The unexpected turn in the story. It's like the, uh, the parable of the lost son. You don't expect the father to see his son from a long way off. And what does the father do when he sees his son, knows he's squandered all of the inheritance he gave him? He runs to him. But none of that is the point of the story. The turn comes when Jesus talks about the 
older brother, the other brother. It's really about the other brother. It's not about the prodigal son. Tum, 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 tum. Because when you look at the points of reference and you look at the unexpected turn in the story, you realize prodigals are not who Jesus is talking about. Or two, his audience isn't prodigals. It's actually... Yeah, kingdom of God. No, it's actually people who think they're great, who think they've got it all wired. Pharisees. He's, he's talking to the Pharisees. How do I know that? They really got ticked about it after he told the story. They clearly understood what he was saying when he talked about the prodigal son, when he talked about the lost coin, when he talked about the, the pearl of great price. When he talked about all those things, he's pointing at the Pharisees and he's going, you guys are the ones I am talking to about, now Armando, the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Okay, why do I keep saying that? Because here's, here, here's the, again, this is totally free, no extra charge. <laughs> As we read about Jesus, and I've said this once before when we've been together, if you pay attention to what he's doing as he's walking around um, the ancient Near East, you basically have this kingdom bubble that follows him wherever he goes. I've talked about this. Jesus is a kingdom bubbler. He walks around in the three and a half years of his ministry, and everywhere he goes, there's a bubble of kingdom. It's an already kingdom. People, when they're in his presence, experience the kingdom. They're like it's, they're in heaven. If you have leprosy, it can't exist in his presence because it no, it's no match for him. If you're, if you're a sinner, if you, have, if you feel like I am steeped in sin, there's no way I can get rid of this. I'm too far gone. Guess what? Your sin is no match for Jesus and his kingdom because he's going to forgive it. He's up to the task of whatever you've done. Think about it. What, what happens to uh, someone who has um, doubts and fears? Can doubt and fear exist within the kingdom of God? What did we just read about in John 20? Didn't I tell you he was going to talk about the progression of, of doubt? Pastor Dave, I mean he. He talked about the progression of doubt. Thomas, put your hands in the places where I've been... Uh, Killed. I, I, they put a spear here. Put your finger in there. Touch my wrists and feel the, the wounds. But his, his word to them is what? Peace be with you. It means have all of your parts together as a whole. Shalom is the Old Testament word. When you have fear and doubt... You step into the kingdom bubble with Jesus, peace be with you is the answer. Your fear goes away. There he is. Mary, he says, Mary. She's freaked out. Where is the body? <laughs> Mary, he says. She's, she's changed. It's you. You're not dead. It's all true. I can't believe it. This is amazing. All of her concerns, where are they once she's in the Jesus kingdom bu bubble? gone. So Jesus is walking around Palestine, ancient Near East, all around Galilee and Jerusalem. Wherever he goes is this bubble of the kingdom of God. And it's such a foreign concept to the human mind that it would be like it is that he tells parables to help us understand what it's like. And that's all that our chapter is talking about. And it's not what Augustine thought. Augustine, did you read that on page? What page was that on, by the way? <coughs> uh, it's like the second page of our chapter, I think. 155. Page 155. I, I wrote my note there, and there it is. Yeah. <laughs> this, this whole long list of stuff on page 155. This means that, and that means that, and this means the other, and this means this, and this means that, and that means Paul. That means Paul? Who went and read the, the bottom of that and went, you're nuts. How could anybody Jesus was talking to possibly understand that he meant Paul 
by, by the innkeeper, that the innkeeper was going to be the Apostle Paul. Nobody, nobody. That's why we do exegesis. Augustine, he's highly you know, held in the, as an early church father. But my brother Augustine was way off. Which is why I have, we're going to get to Revelation. I'm really going to step on your toes then. Oh boy. Because remember this quote I started with. Parables only second to the Revelation. And allegorical is all we grew up with if we're over a certain age. If we were born in the 60s or before, we read a little book by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth. And Jesus is coming back on whatever, whatever that March something, 1972 or whatever it was. I don't remember. I remember sitting in my bedroom, got a copy of that and was freaked out. That's, that is such a misunderstanding. We're going to get there, though. I, I'm getting diverted. And so, why Jesus' parables are so missed by, by the population? <coughs> because they didn't want to hear it. Their hearts were set against Jesus. You know, I, I, they, I, think, I think the Pharisees, a lot of them, actually thought Jesus was the Messiah but they were not willing to give up their power. I think they knew exactly who he was. There's a peer-reviewed paper that I, I read about two and a half, three years ago on this. How, it's really, to me, how hard can the human heart be by knowing that Jesus is who he says he is and killing him anyway? If that's true, oh dark the human heart is dark and so that's the ultimate example for me about why jesus said that he was fulfilling the prophecy hey i'm going to teach about me but the hearts are going to be set against me they're not going to get it because they don't want to they don't want a messiah and a kingdom like i'm offering they want what they had with david remember king david this you know huge warrior king he extended the boundaries of Israel second furthest of anybody. His son Solomon did it more, further, but he didn't, Solomon didn't do it with the sword. He did it with uh, marriages. That's how, that's how Solomon did it. That's why it got so large. Uh, the kingdom expanded. Israel was the largest under Solomon because of all of that. But they wanted David. They misunderstood. He was going to be in the line of David, the shoot of Jesse and all of that. So we have this massive misunderstanding of who Jesus is and what he brought with the kingdom of God. So the one thing I want to say, did you notice that there was a, a theme that was brought up yet again in the exegesis part? Read the parable and listen to it how many times? Again and again, it said. Again and again. Again and again. And I want to say it again and make it even another time. I want to say it clear. When we read the scripture again and again, we give the Holy Spirit opportunity to speak to our hearts and minds if we read it again and again. If we read it in the midst of one another, higher yet. Where two or more are gathered, there I am in their midst. Right? And as, as we gather with fellow Christians, we can see what Scripture says and say, here, Scripture is our guardrail. We have to let it say what it says and not a, an inch more, not a, not, a, not a nanometer more, nothing beyond what Scripture says. And so it, I just wanted to say, did you notice? Obviously you did. It says read it again and again. That's how to exegete a passage. Notice where the points of reference are and then... Who is the turn of events pointing to? That'll help you with the audience. Which, that's that section where it says um, there's contextless parables. There's a section in our, in our chapter that talks about the fact that you can't tell exactly who the context is because the setting isn't given to you. But as you read the parable and you use these two uh, exegesis things, look in who are the points of reference, who are the people in it, and then who is 
the turn of events pointing to, that tells you who their, their audience is, right? So just like Good Samaritan, we, we know who that's pointing to. We, we know that's pointing to the Pharisees because it was a Samaritan. Devil dog. It was a turn of events that no one saw coming. Did you like, this, this is a dangerous question, did you like the modern version of that parable? When it was an atheist that stopped and helped the family and gave him money for a car to get to work? Think about that. That would have been Hal in his early 20s. <laughs> That's his testimony. He gave it on Saturday. Yeah. Right? That, that's a, that is a, a check on everybody sitting in a church who thinks they've got it together right. when they're missing the heart of the gospel. And that turn of events is pointing at and stabbing you in the heart. That's his audience. That's, what the, that's, that's the key interpretation of context that we can get. Because every, every one of those stories has a, oh, 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 a little turn there. And so let's, let's move to um, <clears throat> hermeneutics then. That's where <clears throat> we get on page one, 166 and 167. It, it, this is where you get this phrase that all the parables are pointing to the kingdom of God. And the nature of the kingdom of God, the already but not yet. Is anybody uh, confounded or confused by that term already but not yet? Everybody's got it. So we, we enjoy the benefits of the kingdom already, but it's not fully consummated. It's not fully finished until Jesus returns. Yeah. Um, the... The Civil War was won way before Appomattox. It's just that's where the final armistice was signed, where the general sat down and the cessation of all battles were at Appomattox. But it was pretty well clear that the North had won months before that. Okay? So that's the already, but not yet. And uh, it's going to be finished when we read in Revelation 19, 20, 21 in there, that's, that's when the, the not yet comes and uh, the, the final fulfillment of Jesus' prayer. And so uh, it's 7.01, and I did it. I did it in a half an hour this time. <laughs> Woo-hoo! So you guys can f- find your own groups. I've got lights on in the hallway up above in the bridal room this room behind this wall here is open the library is open um, we need to be back here let's be back here at um, 735 or 740 if you're not back by 740 I'm going to be pulling you back but shoot for 735 ready break ready, ready, go. that's right 740 735 it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. okay we're back Questions, points to ponder, things you want clarification on, things that were confusing perhaps because of your presenter. (laughs) Anyone else but Dan? No, I'm just kidding. He waited. Did you, you have a question? Yeah, the, the context of the parable seems confusing. Okay. Uh, because it just seems that there should be some context associated that you're, you know, whether it's, oh, hey, it's agrarian, or it's a fisherman, uh, or it's around fishermen, or... Right. Right. Contextless means we don't know where he was saying them and to whom. So it's not the context within the parable, it's the context within which he gave the parable. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So several of them just, they get dropped onto our lap, as it were, without any, like, 
and Jesus was traveling, and there were some Pharisees and some teachers of the law, and they were this and they were that. So Jesus told a parable. That's a context where we have some of them are just sort of dropped in. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like. Where did he say that? You know, and that sort of thing. And so we, that's why the, the chapter goes into, you can tell who the context was that he was talking to because of these two things, the points of reference within the parable, and then who's the gotcha turn on the story point to that, right? So that's how you can kind of tell who his audience he was speaking to. And he was trying to tell them more about the kingdom of God. You know how to warm an old man's heart. <laughs> Definitely, it's all about the kingdom of God. I think that's, you know, I, I, I want to make it in a fun way, but that's, that's really that bubble, that kingdom bubble that Jesus was going around. And people ask, why did he perform miracles? Because I think he wanted people to see what the kingdom of God was going to be like. They were physical manifestations of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. When Revelation says there is no more, there are, there are no more tears, there's, there's no more suffering, all of that's wiped away. There, weren't, there was not sorrow and suffering in the, Jesus' presence, only by those who rejected him. The kingdom bubble, when you see what was going on with him and wherever he walked, that is a view of what it's going to be like. If you're living in a time where you're in a culture that overlooks you, uh, mostly talking about a female or a leper or someone like that, you have, you have extreme value. When, when Jesus is in the home of Simon the Pharisee and the woman comes and, and washes his feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair, and then he tells the story, the parable, and it's pointed right at his host you know those who are been forgiven much have great joy that was pointed at his host he was he was proclaiming value for a woman who was broken over her sin and found forgiveness that's who belongs in the kingdom bubble right and and that's why jesus said things like i i came here not for the healthy but for the sick i'm here for the sick you think you guys are healthy? Let me tell you a little parable about a lost son. Man. So, other questions, points of clarification. Someone was asking me, um, this group was asking me about the quote on the, on, that was on the questions, and I'm pretty sure that was Dr. Stewart, which is the second name, the second author, Fee and Stewart. Dr. Stewart gave a series of lectures at Gordon-Conwell, on this book, on the 13 chapters of this book, I'm pretty sure that quote is from him, from that lecture. That's these, these, book, these questions, that's why it says Dr. Stewart said this or Dr. Stewart said that, because these questions are really taken from that class or that set of lectures, and it's a follow-up set of questions for those lectures on this book. And I thought, why reinvent the wheel? Because these are some great questions. And, um, and they really do a good job of asking some really good things. Like, anybody, oh, any other questions? Any clarification? Yes. Got one here, and then we'll go there. What, what was the, I don't know if it's going to really fit in our chapter, what was it about um, Stephen's builder and the new Lincoln? Okay. What was that? The, the, that Lincoln t was a storyteller that tried to grab your attention. That was, a, a, yeah, that was him trying to talk about that. Yep. Okay, yes. Does it mean what they on divisive riddles? That is deep as far as the... Divisive riddles? Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about that as, a, as a, another point, actually, from our text. And divisive riddles are, are basically that discussion of Mark 4 that we started with, that they, they don't tell you truth about who the Messiah is going to be in a way that you want. It's how it actually is. And the, the reason why people can't figure out what Jesus is saying is because they're coming with their preconceived notions about what Messiah should be rather than hearing from Jesus who he really is. And that's why they're divisive riddles. They're, they're telling stories and pointing truth that you don't want to hear because it's not the way, he's not the conquering 
hero David, King David, he's a death dying Messiah who's going to raise from the dead. So they're divisive because the Pharisees don't want to hear about a Messiah like that. They don't want to hear about a Messiah like that. Don't talk about that to me. I don't want to hear about a Messiah that dies. I want to hear about a Messiah that knows how to, how to do a pincer movement. <laughs> That's how you move troops in a way that, uh, that uh, defeats an enemy. Yeah. We are natural born Pharisees <laughs> to this day. We like law. We love law. Give me the yeses and do's and don'ts. And we're going to talk about that next week. This is foreshadowing, right? Mm -hmm. This is foreshadowing for, isn't next week Old Testament law? Yes. What do we do with that stuff, right? We, we're natural born Pharisees. I've, I've talked about this forever. We are humans. If you go like this and you touch your wrist and you feel a thump, 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 thump. Right now, mine's a little faster because I'm up talking. But if you have one of those pulses, you know you're a natural-born Pharisee. I don't have one. Yeah, and, and that, that there is this struggle we have. And, and you know how I know we're natural-born Pharisees? Because we have a history in the church of saying, well, you, you, can't, you can't wear pants as a woman and be godly. You can't wear a beard. You have to have short hair you have to do this or you have to do that. And that's the only way to be a good little Christian. That's new law to me. We're ch no, tell me about where your heart is. Where does your heart beat? What are you broken by? Why, why do you claim to have a, a place in heaven? Tell me your testimony. Is Jesus your Savior? Are you broken over your sin? Are you repentant of your sin? Do you know that Jesus is your only Savior? Then you're, you're going with me. Let's go, you know. Let's not layer law on top of it. And so that's why I say we're natural-born Pharisees. We love law. The most law, knowledgeable law, people, the most knowledgeable people about the law are rebels. Because they got to know what to break. <laughs> Rebellious people know the law so that they know, because they, got, they know so well what, they're, what they want to break. They just know the law. That's us. We, we struggle with grace. When Paul talks in Galatians that Jesus is a new law, we get frustrated by that. Even now, as New Testament believers. We can talk about more about that, but, but let me finish with, um, is that okay? Do we answer those? I want to, yes, okay. So, the analogy that we're given that the parables are like a good joke, did you follow that? Like, if you're telling a good joke, you know it's going to hit because you know your audience, right? you got to know your audience. And if I'm sitting here having to explain, it's not going to be funny. Which is why grandpas that tell dad jokes make their grandchildren groan. Because <laughs> half the time they're having to explain things or they're just like, no, that's, that's bad. So the that Jesus spoke like he's, a, like he's a, a comedian because he knows his audience and he knows it's going to impact and he's going to get the desired effect that he wants and he knows his audience so well that he's going to tell a story that it's going to turn on them and they're not going to see it coming. Like all of those we've talked about, you know, you, you think you've got it, the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan... You know, the story of there's the guy that, on the side of the road and the priest went by and everybody, oh, those stupid priests, they're always, they got their head in the clouds, those pastors, they don't have time for anybody. They don't, they don't live like real people. So the audience went, yeah, of course. And then, you know, the next person comes through, it's like, yeah, you know, but the, you're going to have the Pharisee come through and they're going to stop. Suddenly it's a Samaritan and what? So... It's like a good joke. And if you're having to explain the joke, it's lost on you and you didn't understand because you weren't the audience or you weren't well studied enough or hadn't looked at the parable enough to understand and be in on the joke, if it were, air quotes, in on the joke, right? The bear, Jesus is no joke. Please don't hear me saying. Do not hear what I'm not saying. Jesus is not a comedian, but he's pretty funny. 
right? He's pretty funny. He has a sense of humor, but he's saying those things in a way that he knows they're going to land hard, right? And they're, you know, interpreting the parables in a way that, as we think about a joke, really can kind of help you think about it. Like, Jesus knows his audience. He knew they were going to understand what he was saying. So many times when he tells a parable and it's, it comes in and like lands hard and people are upset at him, you know it hit the way he wanted it to. Because he's like, nope, you thought the kingdom of God was one thing. Here's what the kingdom of God is really like. And we, as followers of Christ, have to understand what the kingdom of God is like. It's already, right? It's already. That's why there's a rocket shooting through the kingdom of God, because it's amazing right now. You ever watched a launch? It's awe-inspiring. It's awe-inspiring. You're far away from, as a little kid, I watched a launch at Cape Canaveral or whatever down on the east side of Florida. Oh, man, it's amazing. Right now, the kingdom of God right now is amazing. We participate in the kingdom of God right now. We enjoy the benefits of that. Do not have yourself so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Do you realize what it's like to trust a Savior who says all of your sins are wiped clean? It's amazing to me. As a pastor, it's a little frustrating. And it's happened enough now that I'm not surprised, but when someone wants to talk to me about Christ and coming to Christ, it's like, well, I gotta get my I gotta get my act together so that I can come to Christ. <laughs> what? You're gonna be the Messiah in your life? You think you can get your own act together without Christ? Your act is gonna be put together by Christ. It's like those of you who wash your dishes or before you put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> it's missing the point of the dishwasher. In this case, Jesus is the dishwasher. <laughs> you come to him to get clean, right? Yeah. And, and when we gather in his name is the most evident of the kingdom of God in the right here and the right now. And the not yet part is the struggle piece of, you know, well, like last week, we have to confront our doubts. We have to look for answers. Let me be clear about that. Doubt should always be allowed in a way that drives you to truth. If doubt has its own way and is left in doubt and you're not seeking answers, you only seek the opposite of the kingdom. You seek and walk away from Christ. Doubt should always be a thing that drives us to look for answers from Christ. I'll make that clarification. It's important, very important to me, that, that we normalize our experience in the already but not yet, because you and I, I mean, I have these times where it's like, am I just crazy? Could all of this not be true? Maybe I'm just confused. Maybe... Maybe I'm just fooling myself. Lord, are you there? Usually there's times where it's difficult, and I'm thinking those things because it's a difficult season. Are you there, Lord? And as I, I say that out loud to the Lord, I talk to my friends that I'm in that place. I have always, I, I'm someone who believes in recovery, been, been in recovery for a long time. I have to have people around me who know the real me who trust that I'm telling them the truth, that I'm going to be confessing to them about what's really going on in my life. I'm broken, and I'm screwed up, and Jesus died for that. And I'm in a season where, Lord, it does not seem like you're there. And I go to him with that. And here's what I know to be true, beyond what I'm feeling. I know that you've worked in my life. I know that you're, there is testimony of your work in my life. That's truer than what I'm feeling right now. Lord, change my feelings 
in accordance with the truth. That's what the risen Savior does in your life. That's what we want to read the parables for and be reminded of what the kingdom is like. It was, it was so important. The seasons that we live in right now, I thought the, our chapter did a great job with this, that it said the urgency that we ought to feel as we look for that pearl of great price, as we look for the lost coin. There's an urgency that we should have because we understand that we're in the already but not yet. Because we long for Christ and the trumpet call and the bema seat and, and the sheep and the goats, right? We, we should long for that. And let's bring as many people with us and have that ride together because it's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And that when we will finally have the body that Jesus has right now, I told you last week, I want that body that can jump into the middle of a room with the, with the disciples in a locked door, <laughs> you know? There was something special about that new resurrected body. He's the first fruits, right? He, he's the first fruits, so our knees aren't going to ache anymore. We're not going to need glasses. We're, you know, all of these things are going to be amazing, and we, we will have full restoration. The, the longing that we feel in our souls to be made whole will finally be given to us. And, and that's the, like the snapshots Jesus was giving us about what the kingdom of God is like, was what his ministry was all about. Not a single moment wasted. And, and you know, we're, we're moving on to other things in our book now, so I just want to make sure that I finish with a, with a Jesus flourish tonight as we talk about his parables. And uh, I, if you haven't figured it out, I'm fully convinced that the scriptures are true and that they are my guardrail and that they are Aslan's deeper truth, that there was a deeper truth that Aslan was operating <coughs> from all along and that's God's truth. And that's what we're operating from. The world thinks it has the truth. It, it's, it's proclaiming victory over our backward little lives as Christians. But we know there's a deeper truth. And that there's a, there is a trumpet call that's coming. And it's at the seat of Christ that we find justice. Nowhere else. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that your word is eternally true, that we can rely on it in a way that our, our hearts may be shaky, our emotions of fear and doubt can sometimes overwhelm us in the moment, but your truth is greater, and your, your salvation is stronger, and that you've remade us from the inside out. Lord, keep us working together through the rest of this class and beyond. Thank you for our time together, Lord. It is such a gift. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Remember, we're together next week, but then the week after that, I think it's the 27th, right? We will have that off because that's Passion Week. That's the only break we're taking, and then we'll finish off the last few chapters. Right? Thanks for coming. <laughs>